you as a, as a designer have to find the time, the ethic, the consistency, the love, the passion, the drive to focus on details. Because details is something this world lacks immensely and we're crying out for it. Welcome. That is David Martin, CEO and founder of Fantasy Interactive. And today we sit down with him to find out how to become a designer and get hired. Thank you so much, David, for joining us. If you could tell us, uh, how did you begin? And if you can, just take us, take us back to when you were still a student and tell us a little bit about where you grew up and what you studied. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, just giving you a call here from Beverly Hills, of all places, why there's some background noise here. You may hear it from a cafe, but um, where I started was a long way from here. Uh, I started in Dublin, Ireland. When I was, I would say, when I went to school, I, you know, I was I was not a good student. Uh, I was a very visually focused person and, uh, vi uh, you know, I communicated very visually. And, you know, I was not good at the academic side of, of things, right? So the left right brain syndrome. And uh, so I, I did quite poorly in school, and I just didn't believe in things like Irish, and I didn't believe in certain subjects that, you know, history and and even math for me, which I, I knew I would never use those in life. So I just kind of tuned out and daydreamed, which ultimately put me into a situation where I didn't get into the colleges that I had hoped as a youngster to get into. But um, I, I had to repeat exams, and I ended up getting in eventually to study uh, science. And uh, when I got in there, uh, I, was, I realized there was, there was women in my class. And growing up in Ireland, it was all boys' schools and girls' schools. So when you got into, you know, into college, all of a sudden, all these women are sitting there. And it's like, oh, my God, you've got to now focus, like, even more seriously, by yourself uh, without being put outside the class, like, in a regular school. And uh, that was just very difficult. So I got thrown out of that. Um, then my mother had to help me find a, you know, when I was, you know, 18 years old, 19 years old, had to help me find another college to go to. And I ended up going to this communications course, which sent me to Germany as part of the course to learn German. And that's where I met my uh, my uh, ex-wife, and uh, who was Swedish, and we ended up, uh, you know, going, checking out Sweden for a couple of months and or a couple of weeks, you know, which turned into a into a seven-year period and that's that's a bit of background of how it started where we went to, to sweden to look for jobs uh, in the united states uh, we realized that we couldn't get any jobs there without a visa uh, I, I, we didn't really realize at the time and uh started started designing david what sort of jobs were you looking for at the time though anything on cruise ships cleaning toilets uh you know whatever whatever it would take to get over to the states and because the job i just came from you know when we were in germany there was about 40 50 of us sent from different universities around europe to learn german and into this castle this five-star hotel and in in, uh, in lieu of being able to stay there and eat your food uh you know we had to work there and the idea is you work there with the gas and you interact and you learn german but my job, unfortunately, was not a fancy job uh, as a concierge or as a, a bellboy. It was uh, house cleaning. Uh, so I was cleaning rooms, cleaning toilets, and that was my, my last job. So I thought on cruise ships, at least I can get a job doing this, you know, to get over to the U.S. And now I got probably at least 40 rejections. And so while that was going on, I started to, you know, explore the Internet. I found it very visually unattractive and, you know, very ones and zeros type thing and so as i was doing that i just found like a passion uh for reorganizing it redesigning it uh, you know trying to present information in a much more and an expectation that i had before i i saw the internet for the first time my 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 expectation was something like more like what you would see on uh you know the the movie theater you know uh, what's that movie minority report for example I, that's what i expected it to be and it wasn't so i started designing uh in my free time, well, which I only had free time, as I was looking for jobs, and that's when things started. And what sort of uh, tool were you using to actually? I was using I was using like a Squarespace, like a, a call homestead, like a website builder, and because I didn't, I, I had no education, I'd no, I'd know nothing, and so um, I never designed in my life, 
and I picked it up uh, sitting there listening to Jennifer Lopez and Britney Spears or whatever was going on at nighttime and you know back then and uh, I just I found I had a talent for you know designing things uh, with a computer uh, you know reorganizing things on a page where I can't draw I can't draw to save my life like I can't if you ask me to draw a picture of a, a dog or anything a, a car I, I can't I can't do it but with a computer I somehow can design it just, it just works and uh, I found that and uh, and that's where we are you know when you put the little details and little efforts into anything um, no matter what profession you're in just that it does pay dividends down the road were there um, any influences or inspirations along the way, like friends or...? No, n nothing like that. But what inspiration for me was um, living on an island, you know, growing up on things like Knight Rider and Airwolf and Baywatch and thinking that the world was a much more exciting world over here, um, you know, which no doubt it is in some ways for sure. In other ways, it's not. But um, for me, it was like I was aspired to, you know, things that are well organized. Clean. Like I, I grew up loving golf courses or like manicured lawns or anything that was like well taken care of. I, ju I just had a an affection for. It, you know what I mean? And so I feel when it comes to that's maybe what you know shaped a bit of my DNA in, with this and but there was nothing like a person oh Philip Stark designed this or some designer designed this like no there, there was nothing you know but I was always blown away by game UI playing games like Nintendo uh, stuff I mean I loved all that stuff and I but I always felt there could be more finesse more refined and so uh, that was it so there was no there was no real inspiration it was just like okay everything is totally shit for on the internet like completely shit and why can't I try and bring some color to this? And uh, so it was, it was a great canvas to work with. So take us through from that point, how then did you enter the industry, let's say, um, yeah. and, and just your progression as well? Uh, so, so basically, uh, in short, um, I started designing and I, I got into Flash because Flash kind of came out at the same time. And it was very, very, very Flash 3, Flash 4, the very early days. And I started, started to, uh, you know, see, oh God, this thing has motion capabilities. And I would love to bring UI uh, to, to life with motion, you know? And so that was that was the a huge, you know, driver for me. And so to combine those things. And so I started, you know, making Flash sites and they start to get uh, notice out there because no one was really working in Flash at the time, or at least they weren't building much sites, they were building banner ads with them. That was that was the intention of Flash, for to really replace the IEC banner ad standard. So I came out with, with uh, you know, start building websites, as did some others, and, you know, brought some music and sound effects into them, and it was just, it was mind-blowingly addictive just to keep going and going and working and refining. And so... Uh, so that's how it started, and because uh, you know, really, I, I found something that you know, like if someone was to do it today, what would they find? You know, it's like on Dribble, like when people put Dribble posts up, then eventually people start using the GIF format to take it to the next level. So it's always looking at well, how can you take something to the next level, and everyone always feels, you know, all right, that's we've well, already reached the level, but only when you get to the next level you realize, oh shit, you know. We, why didn't I think of that? We were so far away. So, you know, um, so that's how it started. And then we got, no, we got, uh, I had to start hiring people for the, for the client work. And then the first main site we did, we got paid 20K and uh, it was for uh, a company called Starbury Studios, which was a game company. So every dollar that came into the company, I would, I would give to the employees, right? And uh, because I, I couldn't take a salary, obviously. So we were, we were, we, we, we basically sacrificed um, to build a portfolio because I knew once I build a portfolio and get that credibility I'll start attracting clients and I did that for about two years and then uh, the second year in uh, there was a phone call or an email um, from our site from uh, Time Warner Cable and they came in to uh, to say hey listen we want to use the Swedish company uh, uh, fantasy interface at the time to help us redo our portal so we were like, oh my God, this this, this massive company is, is interested. So uh, they wanted to get on a call, do a video conference. And we basically had to, we had an internet cafe, uh, cafe at the time that we had as a, a 
place for kids, and not really to make money, but just for kids in the area to kind of not be doing drugs and all that kind of stuff and come and play computer games together, right? And it was in this lo local area in Sweden. And, uh, you know, it was supported by the government, all that kind of stuff, so the local, the local government. And so there, you know, when I would do the video conference, I would have the kids in the background, you know, get them, you don't have to pay, everything's free, come on in, and so the place is full. And I would blur blur the background, but I would have me in focus. So in the background, I thought it was just an office of people, but it wasn't, it was just myself and another guy at the time. And so we, we basically, with two people, uh, got a uh, $2 million contract, uh, which we had to quickly hire, you know, uh, 15 people to fulfill that contract, which we did. And that ultimately uh, got us on the road. With that particular contract, uh, how were you feeling? Like, um, it seems like quite a big oppor opportunity. Weren't you scared yeah. that you could have messed it up or was was just... I could, I could have, but I could... I, I could have messed it up, but I could have, I could have, I could have made it awesome. I knew it was one or the other. If I didn't take the chance, I knew I wouldn't have the chance to fail or succeed. So, for me, you have to be able to take those opportunities and everything you can and make the most of them. Because if you don't, you're only going to fail if you don't even try. You know. Mm. And then from there, the clients just started coming in. Um, was it? Did it become easier, or was there a bit of a couple of troughs and this and that? Well, uh, Time Warner came in, and then Xbox came in a week later. So uh, it was all happening at the same time. Uh, and you know, definitely in any company, especially in an agency environment, there's always uh, you know peaks and lows. Uh, sometimes it can feel like there's more lows because at the end of the day. You're working with people, and you're working with people in the creative space. Where sometimes uh, people in the creative space um, are tough to work with. Sometimes the clients in the creative space are even tougher to work with. So, you know, it's one of those things where the can-do attitude is the kind of thing that has kept us afloat. Uh, and you know, there's no really. I wouldn't say there's there's not there's no, there was never any room for snowflake uh, kind of mentality. In, in our business, you know, it's always it's always like you know we're not going to push people too hard or, or bend over backwards to the point where we're going to burn ourselves out for a client. I mean that's you got because your business is built on people, but the the lows would be when when things were down and it's like how does the team come together and make it into a peak, right? So you know I've got a hundred stories you know behind you know every every low and a hundred stories behind every peak, and but, but what's consistent with all those stories is is uh, survival and it's 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 a team effort it's it's the attitude the can do attitude it's it's knowing your principles the dna when it's time to let a client know this is too much or when it's, it's time to let somebody know you've got to drive hard right so it's one of those things you pick up over time and you know a lot of people just have that natural ability uh, so when you surround yourself with, with really good people, it's easier to deal with those kind of situations. But now we're getting into territory that's more to do with managing a team versus even just becoming a great designer, or, for example, or a developer. Which lends to the question around how did you guys get like Xbox a week later? Was there like a strong marketing promotion or was it just purely referral? So Fantasy has no sales team. We've never had from day one. Uh, today we do not have a sales team. Uh, all our work comes 100% in from, you know, a designer, for example, looking at our work. And when that designer, let's say, works in an Xbox, and their executive producer, producer says, look, we need someone to come in and help rebuild the UI for Xbox or set up the UI, um, who, who should we bring in? And that designer may say, hey, look, I know these guys I followed. I like their flash work, whatever. And that was back in 2002, 2003, right? So that's what happened there, right? So the, that's a consistent story, right? For every year, you know, from 2001 to 2 to 20, whatever, what year are we in now? 2017? It hasn't, hasn't changed. It's still the same. It's like, it's basically make, making sure your work out there is respected by other designers. And those designers will spread the word to the relevant people. And that's how we, you know, good people are always going to be busy. Always. There's, there's not enough designers on this planet. I mean, we are, we're in a massive, massive shortage of design talent. Like, unbelievably, uh, a massive shortage. And so, good people will never, never have a situation where, shit, uh, I've nothing to do. They'll always be in demand. And the key is, you know, to constantly push. You can't just, a lot of people I've seen over the years that have been good, they'll do something good. And then, 
two years will go by and they've done nothing. Nothing. They haven't pushed. Their, their work is the same level as it was two years ago. And the key for any designer and great people and great companies is to you constantly push the bar. Like Unlike Apple, for example, right, where Apple's they are a company where they're kind of falling off the bandwagon when it comes to constantly trying to be progressive. And there's certain reasons and business reasons and so forth that they can't be as effective and as they were when there wasn't no such thing as an iPhone. So when they came out with an iPhone, everyone got their wow impact. And the first time someone touched the interface or saw that screen, you know, that wow impact is never going to be the same with a new phone or a new OS um, as it was from the first one, right? But that attitude should always be about pushing yourself to the next level every six months to a year. You know, don't rest on like, okay, my work was good a year or two ago. Because every time we did great work and it won, that's excited the year or won whatever award. I look back on it a year later and I was like, oh my God, that's such embarrassing shit. I would never do that again. And if you have that going on in your head where you look back at your work and you feel, oh God, that is completely shit. Um, that's an amazing, that's an amazing thing you should hold on to because that is the most valuable tool that you can have to recognize as a designer uh, that, you know, when something's not good enough. I mean, even take, even today, if you design something right now, uh, today, compare it to, let's say, uh, the top 20 shots on Dribble over the past month and put your work beside it. And honestly, ask yourself, does your work feel that it fits in there? If it doesn't, look at the details of the other 20 shots and figure out what about those details? Why are those details better and what are those details and start to implement that same finesse into your work and you've got to put more time into it so if you're in a situation where a client wants you to do 10 things in five minutes you, you know you're not going to get that quality but you as a, as a designer have to find the time the ethic the consistency the love the passion the drive to focus on details because details is something this world lacks immensely and we're crying out for it it's fantastic if someone's starting with, from a place where they don't have experience, right, and they're still they're looking to break in, you've mentioned dribble, you've mentioned how you could, you know, start looking at good work and start uh, yeah. trying to emulate it. What, what other advice would you have with uh, so someone who's starting with no experience? Do do what I do what I did. Do what I did. Cheat, copy. So basically, what you got to do is that for, you know, no one ever taught me how to design. I just liked it. I loved it. Loved the idea of it. And as I started designing my first stuff, it was completely, absolutely, I think, shit. You know, when you look at you look at my work, it was terrible. And but to me at the time, it looked great. But when I compared it to, uh, to some better stuff I saw, I was like, I just wanted to copy it, and I didn't know how to do it. I, I want to be able to do that stuff. So what I did was I took their their work, I put it in my you know, I can't remember if it was a Photoshop or Jask. I can't even remember the name of the software at the time. And Flash. And I tried to copy for exact to pixel that work that I saw. And when I was able to do that, it kind of made me feel like, oh, I've, I, was, I'm, I was able to reproduce that amazing work I saw that's a lot better than mine. So I, I, I figured out how to do it with the tool. And then as I was doing it, I kind of because I'm so focused on it, you know, when you're laser focused on something, you start to feel, well, what if I change this and this, I can make it even better. You know what I mean? Once you kind of try make things better bit by bit and, and test and stand back and have a look and see. And that's how you kind of learn to be as good as that person very quickly. So if you're starting off today as a designer, go to Dribble, look at the top 100 shots, try and replicate your favorite ones. And if you can replicate those, you are in business. And all you got to do is as you replicate those and try to improve them just at just five percent try to make them just a little bit better it's not you don't redesign it just do something slightly different whether it's changing the color changing the gradient or changing the whatever a slight whatever it might be in it a font slightly and see can you make it better than the original and that will sharpen your skills beyond what any university can ever teach you fantastic fantastic and if i was to uh speak on some of the soft skills, perhaps, uh, and technical skills that one must focus on to actually be good yeah. at what they do. 
te technical skills is, is basically, you know, you go on YouTube, you figure out uh, how do I use this tool, how do I use that tool, just watch videos all day long. That's 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 what you got to do. Um, or even you surround yourself with you surround yourself with designers that are better than you. I mean, if you if you work as a freelancer by yourself at home, in your bathroom, whatever, you know, use the internet. If you happen to work in an agency or you have an opportunity to surround yourself by working with better designers, you know, do so. You learn that way pretty quickly as well. Uh, so technically, you know, I, I'm the least technical, I would say, person just in general, right? When it comes to design especially, I, I couldn't speak about, you know, the 50 grid systems and why they're established and why. I mean, I don't I don't care. At the end of the day, I, I the grid is in my head. I can I can look I can look at the screen today and tell you what's five pixels, what's the, what's the width between X and Y just by looking at it. I, you know what I mean? And because I, I had that eye for detail. I don't care about the technicalities. But the the you know the the left uh, the the, the non-technical side is the, the soft skills. I think that they're very more important. It's 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 how you're able to criticize yourself and how you're able to take criticism for, from others that don't snowflake out about it. It's how that you know uh, you you try to be competitive like you go and you look at the top shots and you try and copy them right and you get the technique down it's 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 how you position and brand yourself like if you have a let's say a portfolio and you have let's say three good projects and you've got six other projects that you did two years ago or three years ago I see I, I see probably more portfolios than anyone else on this planet Earth in terms of in our space right uh, we get about 10,000 applicants a year since God knows when and so I I go through the majority of them uh, very quickly, and so I've probably seen more more resumes or uh, more portfolios uh, from digital designers than anyone else on the planet. And I can tell you that if you have three great projects or even one, and the rest are shit, do not put up the shit ones. Because what happens is, it, you know, you look at that work and like that designer made a poor choice in how they represent themselves as a soft skill, and they put up work that sure you're just trying to put up work to show that you're experience I don't care I don't care about your last 10 projects I care about just the best one or two that you have because if you can do that project to that level then I know that you can do everything else with us to, to at least that level that you've just done that great project don't turn me off by showing me the other stuff that you probably didn't have enough time to do you didn't have a sharp skills to do you didn't have as much inspiration to do or whatever just don't put shit up just quality over quantity so, same with dribble shots if you're going to put a, you know, I've got a triple account, you know, it's easy. Look, it's easy to make 10 decent shots over a period of two weeks, right? It's easy. Put up 10 shots. You don't have to put up 50. Just put up 10. 10 really good shots, you know, and just make sure not one of them is shit. And it will stand, it will stand to you, believe me. And does the work have to almost correlate with what you want to do eventually? No. No, not at all. Okay. No, no. Uh, I don't care if uh, if you want to be a designer in the healthcare field, product only, web only, whatever. It doesn't matter. If I can see that you can compose something with the right colors, the right fonts, the design looks, you know, really nice, tight. It could be small things of how you put an icon and a font together. It could be, you know, uh, I mean, I, I, my advice to a lot of people is is to like take things like let's say, like Google News or um, the Android uh, OS and take small components of them and say here's the current Android OS screen for a home page or whatever here's what I think here's the approved version I've done that's the stuff that's going to get you jobs left right and center I know something like that Yes, yes. Do, don't, like, the best work you can do is work without a client telling you what to do. Because you've got yourself. So that's what we do. We do these things called what if case studies or what if um, what if Tinder and travel, what if the airline, what if healthcare, whatever. Do you know why we do those? Because a lot of the work that we do that people have no idea we've done because we can't put it out there for, for you know, legal reasons uh, and PR reasons. Uh, and Or we'll do work that was amazing but the client came in and completely fucked it up you know and and that happens to every agency 
Huh? Which they tend to do quite a lot. Eh? Uh, they do. They do a lot, right? And so that can happen. I know we've got great ways to prevent that. Now we'll we'll say to a client today, um, you know, that happens. Uh, you know, the the rules for working with fantasy are X, Y, and Z. So for us, it doesn't really happen as often as, as it does for other companies. But it still can happen. So, but when you do your own work, like we do the what if airline stuff, what if whatever, we just put that out because oh, we had a uh, two days to spare, or we had a week to spare. Let's just do something together that, that says let's do this without a any limit, you know, and try and but try and be thoughtful and not, and not too unrealistic. And so I would say to you as designers, if you want to go out there and redesign CNN, right, which is the most one of the most consumed news content sites, which is looks like it's from 1986, right, and Make make a better version of that without it being, you know, just fluffy, beautiful, big images visual. But think about the user experience of, of your design can't be beautiful. It has to be smart. Smart, smart, smart design is beautiful design combined with actual design that a user can, you know, actually use. Don't. There's many people I've seen uh, over the years. I've seen portfolios or I've seen them do concept work, and they'll come back with these beautiful designs that are just so based on photography and like and it's just so fluffy and it's very clear that they just they're so minimal it's like it doesn't really the user doesn't really get any value it's like a brochure right so don't don't do that i would i would say also you guys as designers focus a lot on the mobile space you know operating systems artificial intelligence you know folks in those areas and try and come up with like small little eight by six hundred shots to put on your dribble or behind or whatever you want and 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 you know don't don't spend all day long doing your portfolio nobody cares at the end of the day about your portfolio you know your portfolio uh, when people review your portfolio they the, the last thing they want to do is get on a portfolio and figure out how to use your damn site they want to go onto your dribble and hands which is they know exactly how to use it very quickly and all they're looking for is two or three shots that's like that is gorgeous work if he or she did that work we're onto something that's all they're looking for because when you go into a portfolio I have literally 15 seconds per every time I click a link I have 15 seconds and sometimes five seconds to quickly scan and go it's it's it, I close the tab or I keep it open you know and so the last thing I, you know I want to do even if portfolios are beautiful people do beautiful work um, you know in a portfolio it's all this elaborate stuff it's just such a yawn fest for me to get on and go through that work I just don't have the time and and people in my role they don't they don't have the time to go through that stuff now if, if you're a top level experience director or you are you know the head of product for some major company and you want to tell that story especially in the UX field you need really strong portfolios that tell a story right but if you're just you're just a visual designer focus on just building a dribble account on your pants that's that's fantastic advice actually so what's the actual breakdown in terms of where portfolios are actually hosted or presented are they on dribble are they mainly on dribble are they mainly on behance are they mainly a, an actual behance. online site uh, behance and dribble those two those two they're like there's it's just one consistent template and it's only presenting your screenshots of work it's all and that's all we need to see now if you want to like a dribble and 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 the hands especially gives you an opportunity to tell the story and put more screenshots and or more you know of a flow how you came up with something absolutely go and do that if you can but we don't need to see your portfolio with your beautiful profile black and white photo of you looking super hipster in the background you know we don't, we just don't need it like I just want to see your work I don't care what you look like I really love the, uh, the the element that you mentioned just now about how much time someone who looks at a portfolio actually has um, yeah and, it's seconds and, and a seconds portfolio just has to stand out immediately um, seconds I'll tell you here, 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 here's an example right sometimes when, when people write me on LinkedIn for example uh, like a, they don't go through our regular jobs at fantasy.co or, or the, the job site we have They'll sometimes write me a personal message and I'll always when I can, can pay special attention to that right and but sometimes it's very common that you get um, some people that uh, they'll write you an email and they have a completely different you know 
picture of where they are in life. Right? Um, there's a lot of a lot of that out there. Don't be one of those snowflakes that can't acknowledge when something is not that good about your work. Because if, if you don't want to be a shitty designer for 22 years, you can be a shitty designer for a month, two, three months, six months. But you have to grow. You can't say shitty for six months. If you're shitty for six months and it's just not working, get out of the business. You know, you should be improving bit by bit if you listen to the things I'm telling you to do. Um, there's something that you raised from that story, which is being a generalist against versus being a specialist, like being really good at a certain style or something like that. Um, could you speak to that in just in yeah. terms of like just work and stuff like that? Yeah, so you know, there's a lot of work that goes on today um, with clients, uh, and they're 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 much more pushy, and they have different expectations, and things take longer than they used to, let's say, ten years ago, five years ago, even. And so, you know, it wouldn't be strange like ten years ago for me to sit down and design MTV.com in a week, the whole thing from UX to UI, right? Um, the design language, everything. I just just spit it out by myself, right? For example, and. You know, today that's just unthinkable, right? Unthinkable that that would happen. Now, there is certain people out there that can definitely do that, at least on a surface level, and those are unicorns, and they are far and few between. Uh, but what I'd recommend for people is um, to focus on, as a designer, let's say if you're a UX, and your, your, your design skills, for whatever reason, you don't find them as, as fancy or as polished or finesse as others, you feel you'll never get there. But you feel you've got a good, a good talent for, you know, rearranging content and how a user clicks on something and how they get through a flow, making a sign-up process ten times easier than all the crap that's out there now. UX is definitely something you should focus on, right? And there's in the UX world, there's all these information architects which have been producing these horrific-looking wireframes and producing user research, and it's just blah 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 blah, right? There's a lot of room for you as, let's say, a designer to have. Uh, that has design skills, but that can focus specifically on user experience. And then for, you, for those that are into visual, uh, motion is another area I'd recommend that you look into because that's that's becoming a key a key tool in the box uh, to bring UI to life in a way where you're not overusing you're not you're not using motion for anything than improving the user experience. It shouldn't be flashy. It should just be improving it. Um, and you know, so it's it, you as a visual designer, it's focused on design languages so like a design language is like Google material design like for example we were one of the, the main teams that worked in that for, for two years and there's lots of other design languages that we work on and you know there's not enough in my opinion visual designers that are really focused on building out just beautiful digital design languages for for a digital ecosystem for let's say and like say Apple said look we need a brand new look and feel for Apple a look and feel not in terms of their logo not in terms of their brand but in terms of like you go to anything to do with their you can click on anything with Apple whether it's their site their phones or whatever the iTunes store uh, what's it what's a new a new look and feel for that that's a design language right so that to, to I, I think there's going to be a massive shift in as we go forward now in teams that are just a hundred percent focused on design languages right so I'd say as a visual designer focus on those details and that will apply all the way from web to product right so it's, but it starts starts in a dribble shot. A dribble shot, something the size of a dribble shot, can be the start of an entire design language. Believe me, because we, we've done it, we've been there. That's that's what you need to know. You've shared a story of like just a really bad approach and a really like kind of not so good um, portfolio, for instance. Do you have any stories around uh, guys who you just instantly knew like? This is great, and we got a high. Yeah. Can you share some of that? Yeah. You, you, there's, three, there's, there's three levels, right? There's level, let's say, one is, uh, you know, clearly this person is not at the level that we need, uh, so we skip. Uh, level two is, let's say, someone, uh, yeah, they have some good work in here, and there's some shots I wouldn't have put in there, but they have other shots that, you know, like when dribble shots are small, they look better, but when you enlarge them and you go into them, you can start to see where things break down, right? So. 
So we try to make sure when we enlarge them that you know it still holds up. If we see that if they handle typography well, which a lot of designers don't, uh, that's always a good sign. So it's like level two. Level three is that, which is very very rare, and people have uh, someone has a portfolio on Dribble or Behance, whatever, and they've got you know maybe 20, 30 shots, maybe more, and you know some of them are similar, pretty similar, uh, but they're all like immaculately done. Like the detail is just there. And, um, you know, and they sometimes they've added, uh, they're really going to maybe have some UI motion they've added in, whatever, right? But we don't, we don't need you to be three. We can get you to three. We, we need you to be two, you know? Mm. So, it's, so it's really kind of seeing just the potential, which is there, and then we can, yeah. which, which, which you can work with pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Like if you, for example, no matter where you live, let's say you live in, in, uh, you know, where, where are you based on in South Africa, right? Are you in Cape Town? Yeah, Cape Town. Okay, so let's say you're in Cape Town. So you go into like the hands of Dribble and you do a search. Like I need to hire. Let's say I have a company over there and I need to hire designers. I go into Dribble or Behance and I filter by designers that are in that area and I uh, look by followers or I look, you know, and I try to go. You know, people have good work. I get more followers, right? So uh, I will, I will literally reach out to those people myself proactively to be like, hey, listen, you know, we're interested in talking to you. Are you interested? In, and that's how it works. And you know. Uh, that's how it works for lots of companies when they're trying to find you. So, you know, it's 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 not in your location. It's not that hard to be at the top. It really now. If you're in San Francisco and you're in New York and whatever, it's definitely harder. But it's not. Honestly, it's not super super difficult to get there. And some people only have a hundred a hundred followers. Uh, you know, on triple. and triple. The followers really mean nothing to us. It's more about it just helps to expose the work, right? So, but we we quickly scan through as many as we can. And we we will we just look for those top five shots. You know, are they? Do they have the level of finesse? Do they? Do they? Does your dribble shot look like it could be on our dribble page? If it does, you're hired. To them. As long as you're not an, an axe murder snowflake or a you know some kind of diva. So. So so do you think um, even even in that vein of the work that you actually produce that. Uh, it does benefit someone to actually look through the work that uh, Fantasy, for instance, has made and then said, okay, let me try to also emulate what uh, yeah. the agency produces. Yeah, I would say there's companies, you know, out there that are also really phenomenal at what they do. Uh, you know, in, on the dribble side, there's a company called Wayno. Uh, they're based in, I think, New York as well, and San Francisco. And, you know, they've got some amazing people and do great work. Uh, and there's another company, you know, companies like Firstborn, or uh, there's, you know, there's Creative Dash on Dribble. There's, you know, if you go to the, to the I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's, I know, unfortunately, Creative Dash and the Waynos, they were in Dribble in the very early days and and I know from talking with the dribble leadership in the past that it's a bit of a catch-22 where it was great for people to get inspired and see the level that's out there but it's very difficult for other people's work to surface right so they've changed the algorithm and dribble for that to, to happen now so it's a lot more helpful but go out there and look at look at dribble go to teams go to the top 20 teams that are out there and uh, like skip over the, the, the drop boxes and the, the Googles you know whatever and but go more to the to the folks that are agencies like ourselves or Wayno or I think Fire Studios I can't remember the name of them but those companies like Raw Motion you know they all have this this passion for putting nice work now we have tons of nice work we do that we that is nicer than we have a dribble but we can't put it up there all the time right so uh, there's a lot of great stuff coming out which we'll talk about later this year um, but because uh, we're behind, behind these, some amazing operating systems that are just the best work we've ever done by far and we're excited to get that out but until then you know it, it's a just look 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 at those. If you can do anything. If you could do three shots that would fit into any of those top 20 companies, you are a hireable person. I don't care if you started design yesterday um, or you started it 20 years ago. Well, hopefully you're not going to end up like that girl. Uh, but you know what I mean? It's like if you started t today and you could produce three shots, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a job.
Mm, let's let's try to land this. So let me ask you just two more questions. Um, I think one of them is really what sort of design books would you recommend and why? No, no idea. Okay. Never read a book in my life. Or what other sort of uh, pieces would you recommend in terms of upskilling, perhaps, um, and just keeping up to date with stuff? Like, what sort of uh, sites should could they visit? What sort of uh, design inspiration yeah. could they? I've always been a fan of the FWA, um, AA awards, that kind of stuff, and, you know, keep an eye on Dribbble and Behance, those four things. You know, just make sure you always see the quality, because no matter whether you like it or not, every couple of months or six months, that bar goes up bit by bit. You know, it's like, it's constantly slipping up, and you got to just keep up with it. And it's, look, if you feel you can't, just copy. Copy someone else's work. Obviously, don't give it to a client, but copy it just so you can feel like I can do what they did. And that will give you that confidence and give you the technique and the process to be able to then manipulate that work into your own. Okay, and uh, I think lastly, is there anything that you'd like to leave with our listeners? Um, yeah, just to land this uh, session. Yeah, I would say uh, passion, attention to detail, uh, and the small details make a massive difference. Yeah. David, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this has been amazing. Um, and I'm sure our audience is really going to enjoy this actual conversation that we've had. All right. And one more thing for that audience that is listening, right? Uh, if you're a designer, no matter where you are in the world, uh, we are hiring remote designers right now, uh, which has been super successful for us. It's fantasy.co forward slash remote, R-E-M-O-T-E. And uh, you'll see some details of how you can apply in it. All we need is your dribble portfolio, perhaps, whatever. We'll have a quick look. If it's something that we like, great, we'll, we'll reach out to you. You can work from wherever you want. In your mom's basement to your palace and whatever penthouse you live in, we don't care. And uh, it gives you an opportunity to work with fantasy, which a lot of people would love to do, but they can't make it to the United States, to New York or San Francisco. And uh, so that's what's going on. So if you're interested, uh, reach out. Excellent. I'll also put uh, that link into the show notes. Thank you so much, David.